Good afternoon. All right, good afternoon. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the names down and just a couple things to note, okay? Is uh, for one, I'm giving you a couple more days to do the test uh, because of, um, I've just put up the, the video or I'm just going to, I wanna give you time uh, to, to watch the video uh, as you're taking it. Also, I've had a couple uh, students uh, make, uh, have some uh, unforeseeable events happen. The computers break down, et cetera, in the middle of the test and it took the raw score and they hadn't finished. And so I'm gonna give you two attempts, okay? You could have two attempts at the, at the test and it'll take your, automatically take your highest score. So uh, I normally don't do that, but we're under kind of special circumstances. Please note though, however, you're still going to, um, in two days, you still have the next assignment due, the War for Independence. So we'll meet again on Wednesday and I'll go over the War for Independence and perhaps even the one after that. Um, okay, so you have a, a couple extra days to do the test, but we can't afford to push back the next due date. So you also in a couple days have the next assignment due. So make wise use of your time, okay? Um, it's, it's tough in the summer being under a, such a concise, um, uh, yes, yes I did. All right, so let's see here. I got your name down, I'll rush, so let's see here. Still getting the rest. Um, I will add on to your score the following. For one, I'll add to the score your um, your extra credit for being present at this meeting. And secondly, I'm gonna give, uh, I need to take a look at the, the test. Uh, however many questions pertain to the War of 1812, I'm gonna give you those as well, okay? So you need not worry about those. Um, just, uh, there should be about three uh, on that topic. We just, we literally ran out of time, okay? So sorry, I was, um, I'm getting these down. So hopefully, uh, yeah, you saw my latest uh, announcements. Uh, as I'm getting these names down, um, are, there, uh, are there any questions? Yes, and um, if you uh, were right on schedule or even a little ahead of schedule and did the War of 1812 uh, and you submitted it, you do not have to do the Early Republic. Just remember that the Early Republic has material on it that is pertinent to the test. So make sure that you read it. But if you do the War of 1812, uh, you do not have to do uh, the Early Republic. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. I always uh, try to adhere to that, that whenever I make a mistake or I'm uh, negligent in some fashion, that your grade does not pay for it, all right? If I have to push dates back, uh, due dates, if I have to you know, change this or that uh, variable, that's fine by me, all right? Because I don't want you to suffer for it. Almost done here with the names. If you did both in a rows, um, I'll give you extra credit. Yeah, I'll give you extra credit for it. Now, 50 points is, is a little bit too much. So I, I won't give you full credit for two assignments, uh, to be honest, uh, that, that just, I, I don't know. Um, but I'm willing to give you half. I'm willing to give you 25. Uh, and 25 points is a lot. Uh, oftentimes, 25 points will, will ch can easily change uh, from one letter to another. OK, uh, Fabian, that's great. So yeah, I'll, I'll give you up to 25 points for the second one, all right, for the extra assignment. That's fine by me. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Shoot, I'm missing, oh, there we go. Okay, so are there any other questions before we jump into uh, test two? Any other questions? So you have two, uh, two chances at it. All right, and it's not due for a couple more days. All right, so let's go ahead and share the screen. Oh. 
All right. So looking at the test itself, okay? You need to be familiar with a, 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 the basic interpretations to the war for independence or whether or not you believe it's a revolution is a subjective point, okay? Uh, did it constitute a 180 degree turn politically, socially, and economically? I know not. Uh, every time I read a new book, I'm a little bit more um, uncertain of that. So at any rate, um, context, however, uh, to the war for independence, you need to remember that um, we mentioned it's all found in the intro. So much of the test is directly, comes directly out of the argumentative assignments, okay? So keep that in mind, keep them available. Uh, obviously, I, I couldn't keep you from doing such, but I'm philosophically not against uh, you go ahead and using open notes and having your uh, having access to your um, your argumentative assignments while you take the test. Okay, so for one, we did talk about a population boom, uh, dispersion into the cities, dispersion from the cities into the western frontiers, and how uh, this is going to uh, encourage uh, Parliament as well as the administration of George III back in England that they need to make uh, some administrative changes to gain a better, tighter hold over the colonies. And this is going to bring about uh, confrontation, to say the least. Uh, we also mentioned political ambiguity. Remember, the English common law, it, it's, it's complex. Uh, it, it's a series of uh, parliamentary laws, uh, crown edicts, uh, judicial decisions, uh, all kind of amalgamated and evolving in time rather than one definitive written document. And so as far as the rights that the, um, that the American colonists claimed as English colonists, uh, it, was not, it, it was not absolutely um, you know, uh, beyond contention, all right? Uh, so that added to friction and, and, and misunderstanding, all right? Um, also uh, events like the French and Indian War and Briti the British, uh, as of 1707, it became Great Britain with Scotland and Northern Ireland, et cetera, right? And we were under Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain enhanced its territories and that added stress and strain uh, because you have to send soldiers uh, in case they're to police uh, for crime, et cetera. You have to worry about skirmishes and battles and wars erupting, especially between the Euro-Americans and the Native Americans, right? And so all that added stress as well. Um, let's see here. But they did also, what also added stress is they wanted to uh, make good at this time, the administration, Tories and Whigs alike uh, in the British Parliament, as well as the Crown, uh, George III. They wanted, you could make the argument that there was a, a kind of a placating policy where they wanted to placate the Native Americans and, and keep Euro-Americans off their land, okay? And so with the proclamation of 1763, whereby Euro-Americans could not travel west of the Allegheny Mountains between the Alleghenies and the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. That was to be reserved to the Native American tribes and American Euro-Americans took exception to that because that was their American dream, heading westwardly and squatting on land. All right, uh, the main interpretations that you find in the handout, right? Uh, the, uh, the one that we learned oftentimes as children uh, is, is kind of synonymous with Bernard Balin and uh, Gordon S. Wood as popular historians. And um, they contend, right, that we had a revolution. They contend that there were revolutionary ideas beginning in the 1740s, actually before that. Some of the works that they cited were from at least the 1600s, if not earlier. Uh, but they, they had a philosophical movement, right, called the Enlightenment. They had a religious movement called the Great Awakening. They had a, um, uh, an Enlightenment movement in Scotland, all right? And so um, with those ideas, what were some of those ideas? We talked about them, uh, natural rights, rights that human beings are entitled to regardless of, of civic rights. Civic rights are man-made. They're, they're accepted and they're, they're uh, permitted by the government. But the argument is, is what the government gives, the government can take away. If it's your natural right, it's more secure philosophically, right? Because you're entitled to it by nature of being a human being. 
And so uh, they talked about natural rights. We talked about uh, the equivalent of your First Amendment rights with writers like Voltaire, uh, freedom of expression, freedom to peacefully protest the government, uh, freedom of the press, uh, to let the, the, the public know what the government is up to, uh, et cetera. We talked about due process rights like Beccaria, uh, the rights that, that every human being ought to have when um, suspected of having committed a crime. Okay, so we, we, we delved into that. Uh, I mentioned uh, Diderot and Condorcet, gentlemen who wrote the French encyclopedias. And they, they basically, right, uh, I hope I'm not going too far here, but I'm inferring that, that that's highly tied to what Thomas Jefferson wrote as the pursuit of happiness, uh, the right of self-cultivation of every human being uh, to rise up as high as his or her talents and hard work will permit him or her, okay? So opportunities to be open to school, education, uh, all the economic trades open to everyone, et cetera. And that's tied also to the idea of a free, a free economy, right? Like with Adam Smith and his Wealth and Poverty of Nations book, and the idea that, that, there are, that mercantilism is um, parasitical in nature, it's arbitrary, and that uh, the free economic transactions ought to be open for all human beings, right? Because again, these are known as natural rights, not just civic rights. So those are some of the examples we went over. Uh, we talked about the social contract. Government exists by the permission of the people. Uh, and the government is our servant, not our master. And the government's role is to protect our natural rights, right? And when the government fails to do such, we have the right to, um, to oust those who are governing and to replace them with uh, a new government that will uh, be adherent, adherent to, um, to our needs and our rights and our freedoms, okay? So we talked about that. The Scottish Enlightenment was all about uh, libertarianism, arguably. And so uh, it was the idea that, that man cannot be trusted uh, with too much power. And so um, he ought to, um, there ought to be limited checks and balances in government, like Montesquieu's book, A Spirit of the Laws. Uh, there ought to be checks and balances uh, between different governing officials and different bodies like the legislator that writes the laws, the executive that executes or carries them out, uh, the judicial that adjudicates disputes and interprets the law, etc. right? So at any rate, um, there's that notion with the Scottish Enlightenment as well. And the idea with Bernard Balin, right, is that we had intellectual midwives, uh, as he calls them, uh, people who had the time, the means, the leisure, the education to read these works as they were percolating in the press, right, and printed, and to um, basically summarize them and put them in, in very short, simple um, form so that the average person had the time, the intelligence, and the means uh, to interpret those ideas and to be influenced by them, right? So hence, when you look at grassroots organizations made by people with very minimal education, uh, some of the Sons of Liberty chapters, et cetera, right, during the War for Independence, they're gonna cite natural rights. They're going to cite uh, the, the term social contract, consent of the governed, and so forth. And we don't know that many of them, if any of them, had the time and means to read John Locke's Second Treatise on Government or Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Social Contract books right? But it doesn't matter to, to Bernard Balin is that the average person became enlightened through the intellectual leaders of the rebellion, like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Dickinson, John Adams, uh, etc. All right. And so that's Bernard Balin's thesis. So that, uh, oh, and then also remember the Great Awakening and the Great Awakening was for conditional deference, okay, that you defer to your authority only if and when, right, um, they deserve it. Uh, when, when they're following, in this case, it was with the clergy. So only when they are following God's laws and precepts and, and uh, ruling the Anglican church uh, and congregational and Presbyterian churches, et cetera, um, in a godly fashion, that if they're not, you have the righteous right to rebel against them, all right? And so these types of ideas are percolating uh, through pamphlets and uh, 
um, articles in the newspapers and almanacs and, and so forth in large number, uh, especially around 1774, all right? And so you have all this uh, going on with that thesis. Then you have a more, um, a more cynical, I would say, thesis, more in line with what the British oftentimes teach uh, when they cover our rebellion and independence from Great Britain, and that is the salutary neglect thesis, right? And that thesis, instead of focusing on ideas and the role of ideas, revolutionizing the minds and the expectations of American colonists, instead you focus upon powers and opportunities that American colonists had acquired and had grabbed for themselves long before the war for independence. And so you find that, I believe, on number one of the handout and uh, known as the salutary neglect thesis that we were neglected by England, but it had a healthy or salutary effect on us. So uh, it's oftentimes, perhaps simplistically, likened to a son or daughter, oftentimes left by a father uh, figure who has, um, rather strict rules on paper, but fails to enforce them and is often gone uh, with other business. And so then sud suddenly one day uh, the father comes home and tells the son or daughter, hey, now, uh, now's the time where I'm going to crack down. I'm going to uh, enforce these laws, these rules, and you're going to abide by them. And the idea is that son or daughter is already 18, 19 years old and doing very well, doing very independently without dad. And so the son or daughter says, sorry, dad, too little, too late. Um, I've had it good for too long. Uh, I'm not going to give up on this good thing, on my independence. And so hence that we fought that we were kind of like spoiled children uh, whose assemblies garnered power after power. And I give you examples of that in the handout and um, who smuggled and did what we pleased economically, even when on paper, it wasn't legal for us to do so. And then when the British government tried to crack down in the 1760s and 70s, uh, we were not having any of it. All right, so that's known as the salutary neglect thesis. Then you have a, a gentleman, right, uh, Joseph Ellis and his book on Washington. And he contends that there is more to this, right? That, um, that there was a selfish component. There was an ambitious component. Uh, as far as the alleged motives of our founding fathers who took control of the rebellion over the Continental Army, over the Continental Congress politically, et cetera, right? And so they contend that these people were, were, were selfish. Uh, they're, they were very self-oriented, ambition-oriented. And those ambitions, oftentimes, like with Washington, were thwarted by the British and by the British system. Uh, one such component of that system was called patronage. And under patronage, you had to have the right connections to be able to engage in certain economic activities, to have access to certain titles and lands and offices. And if you didn't have the connections, you, you, it didn't matter how worthy you were of office, you were left out. And so to Washington and others, right, that seemed unfair. They had kind of ingrained in them, in, in their psyche, arguably, and in their culture, more of a spirit of meritocracy, uh, that you get what you merit, you ought to get what you earn, what you work for, and what you deserve. And so hence, you find that with Washington as a cash crop farmer, becoming frustrated with the hated middlemen that were taking the lion's share of his profits. And you find that especially in his ambitious designs to move up the uh, military uh, hierarchy and doing well, he thought, uh, in battle, and the British uh, continuing to snub him and to exclude him, all right? And so you have that with Joseph Ellis's book. And then perhaps even more cynical as a thesis, you have Howard Zinn. And Howard Zinn contends, right, that the founding fathers were afraid of a class war, that, that you, you could find evidence, according to Howard Zinn, in the 17, by the 1770s, of a big disparity between the haves and the have-nots uh, virtually in every colony. But he focuses a lot on Pennsylvania and New York and the middle colonies when you had this kind of upper echelon of mercantile and uh, bourgeois uh, elites. And um, then you had a, a big burgeoning population of the homeless and those who were just barely getting by. And so then with the Stamp Act riots, 
you see evidence, right, whereby uh, some of the uh, colonial leaders who were, who were elected members of the assemblies, right, they had complaints against them by their own constituents, contending that they were not doing their jobs, that they were not looking out for the best interest of those that they were representing, especially those in the western periphery of the regions that felt they were being underrepresented uh, in their colonial assembly. So you have that, that, that friction and that class consciousness, right, of the poors, of the poor looking at the well-to-do assemblymen who had become the founding fathers and contending that these guys are not one of us. They're not a microcosm or many example of us. Uh, they're their own class with their own ambitions, et cetera. So then uh, you have evidence in some places like Massachusetts, et cetera, whereby uh, the committees of correspondence and these other organizations tied to the assemblies. Uh, so men that were accustomed to being in the system, in the political system, uh, trying to reach out and trying to almost deliberately antagonize uh, the common folk uh, into uh, boycotting British goods that had taxes on them, uh, going after tax officials and tar and feathering them, um, et cetera, right? Uh, threatening people to step down from office, uh, British officials, et cetera. And then there's evidence that when these, um, these masses of protesters began to uh, act extra legally, uh, to begin to engage in mob violence and destroy well-to-do houses uh, and, and, and so forth, that you have writings from people like John Adams, even Samuel Adams and others who expressed a sense of horror and fear that the, 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 the masses of, of people, of commoners, were going to rise up and indiscriminately attack everybody who was well-to-do, which would include the Founding Fathers. So that hence the Founding Fathers, very shrewdly, they hijacked, they took over this popular rebellion, right? And what they did is they used the Enlightenment, the Scottish and French Enlightenment, the Great Awakening, etc., as propaganda to try to appease the common people and telling them, please come and fight for me, right? Um, and we promise you a better world with natural rights and uh, a new written constitution and a new nation that is more enlightened than we uh, have presently under the British system. And so it was like a deal, right? A, a selfish manipulative deal. And then they also not only used the carrot uh, to dangle in front of the common people to get their participation, but they used a stick as well. Uh, with the Continental Army, there were a couple uh, militia um, uh, rebellions, uh, mutinies. And so then you have George Washington and others begin to crack down on their own colonial people and telling them there's going to be law and order, telling them they have to fight for the rebellion. Um, and, and so then there were, there were punitive elements to this as well. So that's what Howard Zinn contends, is that the Founding Fathers were a... Um, a very class conscious group that manipulatively took over uh, uh, what they were fearing to be a class war uh, so that they could be the top dogs standing, right? And they conveniently used the British as the scapegoat, telling the common people, see, the British are your source of grievances, not us. All right. So any questions so far? Okay, I'll help you with the, the, um, the textbook one more time, okay? I like to think that you have your textbooks by now, but just in case for a few of you, if you don't, uh, please note, um, I, I pretty certainly will ask you to do the textbook questions on your own by test three, okay? So Alan Brinkley in the textbook, he seems, when you read the intro, uh, to me, he seems to adhere to the salutary neglect thesis that the colonists acquired more and more powers, more and more freedoms that were not initially intended for them to practice and have. And then the British tried to crack down at the end of the French and Indian War, and we weren't having any of that. We fought to keep a good thing going. So he doesn't go so far as adhering to Howard Zinn's thesis, okay? Um, then going on to the uh, early Republic, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the, um, the Confederation uh, one, Number 10, it aligns with number one, and number 11 aligns with number two. So remember we talked about that, the, how I'm kind of a little bit bored with the, the historiography of the Confederation because there's not a lot of debate 
they oftentimes adhere to the same boring old thesis. And that is, right, is that the, the, uh, the states, they had a relatively democratic government, each of the states, with a lot of enlightened principles espoused in their written state constitutions, because each state wrote a constitutional uh, new charter during the rebellion, right? And a lot of them were arguably very enlightened and liberal, uh, wanting to change things and wanting to maximize human rights, uh, with exceptions, of course, of women, Native Americans, and African Americans, right? And so at any rate, um, when the states were doing such, uh, they had a very loose, deliberately loose, decentralized confederacy. And it, it was meant to optimize their freedom. And the argument is, is they took advantage of that freedom and they abused it, right? Uh, again, like a, in paternalistic terms, like a kid, uh, an adolescent uh, young man or woman who gets optimal freedom suddenly and abuses that freedom and does some pretty rash, uh, foolish things. And so, and hence, right, the idea is like with the founding fathers like James um, Madison and others, they would write that um, government is the fig leaf of man. Like when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their innocence and uh, they realized then that they were naked. They were no longer like children. Um, and they, they, they sewed uh, fig leaves to cover themselves, their bodies, right? So that hence it's a... Um, uh, it's a badge of our sinfulness, right? That government is because he states, right? If men were like angels, we wouldn't need government. We could technically live in an anarchy with no government, but man being what he is, is uh, he, to whatever extent he cannot handle freedom, then that freedom needs to be cut short or curtailed. And there needs to be a as a necessary evil, um, uh, a burgeoning, growing size, scope, and power of government uh, to regulate what he can and cannot do. And that's the argument with the Confederacy, is the states acted selfishly with one another, and, uh, and it created a bit of chaos uh, between the states, and that within the states, people acted very rashly when it came to economics, especially with loans and debts, uh, wanting to get the debtors out of debt at all costs and causing inflation and, uh, and uh, credit issues and so forth, right? Then when number two, uh, Pauline Meyer in her book, Ratification, she contends, right, that um, the, um, the founding fathers did not initially intend uh, the constitution to be very democratic, uh, nor to be very enlightened but it was rather conservative as a document and as, as a new government uh, going away, drifting away from this confederation. And she contends that it was only popular protest, right? A popular insistence uh, within the states during the ratification process of, of approving or ratifying this constitution that founding fathers wrote uh, behind closed doors with no press allowed and they wanted to basically correct their own paper. They wanted to ratify it, some of them, uh, without even popular approval. And that didn't work when they went back to their respective states, right? And the different people, constituents, and other political leaders in the states insisted that they have a say in this new constitution. And there, there from, you uh, arguably was derived the Bill of Rights, for example, uh, whereby people contended we're not okay with this constitution unless there is a, um, an enumerated, a specifically stated right for citizens for such and such, or for such and such, as you read throughout the, uh, the Bill of Rights, okay? So then, um, let's see here. So technically the type of government that the founding fathers devised in the summer of 1787 was a, um, a constitutional, right, so that uh, in theory, at least on paper, that the constitution is the ultimate law of the land, that sovereignty, uh, the, the, the right to have authority over us is derived by popular consent, of course, right, by the consent of the governed, but that consent was given once nine of the 13 states uh, passed or ratified the constitution, 
Now the Constitution is the law of the land. And the idea was that the Constitution would be enlightened. The Constitution would be colorblind. Uh, it would be, um, you know, uh, just more consistent than man, than mere man. So hence with the president having to swear allegiance and an oath, right, to defend and follow the Constitution. And then we have a federal republic. And the federal part, right, is a combination of a decentralized government, like a confederation or a confederacy, whereby the local regions, remember libertarians like that, to keep government as weak and loosely constructed and localized as possible as a lesser evil, to keep the governing authorities more accountable, arguably, and a unitary government, which is a strong central government dictates policy everywhere. So we have a combination of that, right, in our federal system, whereby like our Article 1, Section 8, Congress, the, the central government uh, legislator, Congress, has a lot more powers than it did under the Confederacy, right? That's conservative. But then the 10th Amendment says that anything not given to the federal three branches is and not mentioned in the Constitution is reserved or left over for the states and local governments. Uh, to, to devise. So we have a combination, right? We have concurrent powers. Uh, states can make their own laws. Uh, states can tax their own people, um, etc. In addition to the federal government, Congress doing such. But uh, there are, um, there are uh, historic judicial decisions uh, ad adhering to a supremacy clause, contending that a, a state's laws cannot contravene those of the federal government. So at any rate, um, we have a constitutional federal republic. And I just stick to the simplistic idea of a republic under um, Aristotle, that it has elements of democracy, of the demos, the, the, the commoners uh, participating in government, elements of an aristocracy, or a body of people that are kind of insulated from popular approval and popular voting and election and they're supposed to be the better sort, uh, who, um, who are better read, more educated, have more leisure time, and supposed to be better apt to rule. And then elements of a, a, a monarchy, of a strong chief executive. Okay, so that's what we have. And our capitalist system was never laissez-faire, was never government let it be, right? As you read in number one of the early Republic handout, uh, the, uh, from the get-go, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, uh, instituted a system whereby the federal government um, heavily got its hands involved in the national economy and in the state economies for that matter. All right. So uh, any questions so far? All right. Um, so uh, enlightened and, and conservative components of the Constitution, enlightened components are that the House of Reps have to approve taxation, and they are elected, uh, one rep for every 30,000 civilians, right? Uh, there's a system of checks and balances uh, between and amongst uh, the, three, um, the three main branches. Um, let's see here. Uh, the Bill of Rights, of course, is, is, is enlightened. Uh, when you see the First Amendment, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, separation of church and state, right? Um, but notice, nothing was done on universal citizenship, right? Uh, we're very, very uh, far behind uh, in that enlightened concept, right? Very far behind, as you may know, uh, getting into the Civil War, uh, with the 14th Amendment, we finally enfranchised or gave citizenship to African American men uh, after a long bloody war. So obviously we did not, the founding fathers did not um, adhere to the enlightened notion of universal citizenship. Uh, conservatively, Article 1, Section 8 gives a lot of power to Congress now, a lot more than to the Confederacy. I would argue that that is conservative. We implicitly accepted slavery, very conservative, right? Senators were not popularly um, elected at that time, uh, not until 1917 uh, with an, a new amendment. 
And so that's, that's a while from happening, okay? Uh, let's see here. Uh, that minutes of the congressional meetings ought to be published from time to time. You will find that in the constitution, but I would not consider that to be conservative. I consider that to be enlightened, right? Because that's encouraging transparency where we could see what the government is up to. So then going on between the conservatives and the liberals, the left and the right, so to speak, right? Amongst the founding fathers is recall that what I mentioned, I subjectively think the gulf between the left and the right compared to that in other countries is rather narrow. Uh, those on the right did not want, yes, granted Hamilton flirted with the idea of a chief executive that would serve for life. Um, and, um, you know, a few other components to his platform were, were rather conservative, more conservative than what the founding fathers finally agreed to but he still wanted a republic. He still wanted a federal republic, and he certainly wanted a constitutional federal republic. Uh, he was a downright, uh, almost a downright abolitionist. Um, and so he really was not that far to the right, arguably. Then you look to the left, the anti-federalists who were libertarians, wanted to get away from big brother and big government, et cetera, right? They were not for ratifying this constitution because they felt it was too centralized, too undemocratic, okay? Uh, the anti-federalists, they would morph into the Democratic Republicans as the first oppositional party to the Federalists. And the Federalists were the conservatives who wanted this less democratic, more centralized government compared to the Confederacy that we left, that we dropped behind, okay? And so with the, conserv uh, with the liberals, they weren't really that liberal, I would say. Uh, very few, if any, took a stance against slavery. Very few, if any, had flirted with the idea of universal citizenship. They sure as heck didn't flirt with the idea of uh, land redistribution for the poor. And so you find some of those elements, right, uh, in Latin America on the left, wanting radical change. And you don't find that amongst our founding fathers. So I would make the argument that the left and right spectrum, that gulf between them was not that broad uh, when compared to that of other countries. And so, which would be bittersweet, I think. In the short run, you're more apt to uh, get along with one another because your, your differences really aren't that fundamental. And so it might be in the short run better for the sake of unity and peace. Um, but then if you really wanna get something done that is considered, you know, a bit revolutionary, like universal citizenship, uh, you're gonna run into uh, some problems because the two institutional pipelines, the two political parties, neither of them will embrace that, all right? And so at any rate, um, and hence, you know, you have the civil war and all that. So let's see here. With the conservatives, like with number 18, their argument was that they still wanted reps to be elected, at least in one of the two houses, right? They just wanted the quote, better sort to be elected, right? Um, but they still wanted the better sort to be accountable. And the argument was, as I said it in class uh, last video, is do you believe everyone is equally entitled to the same rights, protections, and opportunities in society? And of course, it's a rhetorical question, the answer to which should be yes. But then if I ask, do you believe that everyone is equally capable of fixing your car or of writing an English paper? And of course that answer is no, right? People differ in their talents and their skills, et cetera. So likewise, the conservatives thought that as well, is that the, um, that the, the better, the people ought to trust their vote and their legislation and elect someone who is better capable than they are uh, of ruling who has more leisure, who has more education, who has more political experience, et cetera. All right. Then moving on to 20 and 21 is uh, you find that straight out of number one on the early Republic handout, as well as number 22 um, uh, and 23 uh, is you find the, the somewhat of the joke that George Washington was afraid of no man during the war for independence, but he was scared of his own shadow when he became the president because he was so afraid of the country polarizing, right? Uh, magnetically pulling itself into two warring camps. 
uh, incompatible camps. And so to him, right, he tried to do everything he could to look as if he were neutral between the left and the right. So for the left, he had press conferences, uh, went on regular walks where he was uh, accessible to the common people, right? Uh, he relinquished his sword at the end of the fighting, right, to uh, and adhere to what the Continental Congress told him to do because he didn't want to become a military despot, right, or tyrant. Um, he uh, he recognized and 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 uh, tolerated a, a hostile press. There was a guy named Philip Freneau in the in the, the National Gazette and other newspapers that regularly tore into him and into his administration, especially um, Hamilton. And he allowed that to happen, right? And then he stepped down after two, um, you know, at the tenure of uh, two, two terms as president. But then for the right, he, in, he, he declared uh, executive privilege whereby he, he contended he was not gonna share everything with Congress he gave a long lease to, Ale to um, um, Alexander Hamilton uh, with his economic system, right? Um, he also uh, was okay with Jay's treaty and that was very pro-Britain and in a little bit uh, emasculating to us because we didn't get them to stop the practice of, um, of uh, impressment of American sailors and then in merchants and um, yeah, and then he cracked down on the Whiskey Rebellion. So those things please the right, okay? But supposedly Hamilton's perceived excesses going too far is what literally frightened an oppositional party into being. And remember people like James Madison actually switched sides. James Madison wrote most of the constitution was for having a less democratic, more centralized government from the Confederation that he thought was a mess. But then he felt like Hamilton under the first administration of Washington had gone too far in the conservative direction. And so he joined the liberals, the libertarians, right? And joining the, um, the Democratic Republican party as an oppositional party to the Federalist administration of George Washington, okay? And so, um, and remember some of the things he did he borrowed money from the wealthy uh, through bond certificates. So people were worried about a plutocracy. Um, he subsidized businesses whose uh, endeavors were meant to be for the betterment of the entire national economy. But again, who were those willing and able to engage in infrastructure, new industries, those who were likely already wealthy. So it looked like he was always working and dealing only with wealth, the wealthy in the country. Um, he took over states' debts, and the idea, if you're a libertarian, is what the government takes over in your local administration for good today, it could do for evil tomorrow. And so they didn't even like that idea of him taking over the state's debts uh, under the, the, the national administration. And then, of course, his hated bank. Uh, nowhere in Article 1, 2, or 3 are you going to find a reference or permission for a national bank. And then the excuse uh, that was utilized in the court of law was the necessary and proper clause that the government has the right to collect taxes, to regulate interstate trade, et cetera. And then it is necessary and proper in order to be able to do such things for the government to, ha to have a national bank, which Britain already had too. So it definitely seemed like he was emulating Great Britain. Okay. And so, um, yeah, all those things, okay? And then number 24 moves on to number two of the early Republic handout. And remember, uh, McCullough writes somewhat in court history fashion, uh, almost kind of praising and trying to get the reader to empathize with John Adams, contending that he was such uh, an honest man, such an independent-minded man, that he, it, he ended up alienating both the left and the right and failed to win re-election. Okay, so um, in alienating the left, the, uh, his Congress, his Federalist Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, arguably constitutionally dubious or doubtful on how constitutional these things are. The Alien Act 
He gave the right to deport radical French citizens during the French Revolution to the president. That power historically, right, or, or constitutionally can be found in Article I uh, given to Congress. So Congress is arguably giving one of its powers to the president. And then the Sedition Acts, right, is curtailed or cut short uh, um, our First Amendment rights, contending that if your freedom of expression uh, in any way had a consequence in which it promoted sedition against the government, uh, you could not speak or write those words. And it looked even worse when some of the oppositional parties to his administration were shut down and arrested under that constitutionally dubious law. Okay, Hofstadter's thesis is the mommy and daddy thesis to John uh, to Thomas Jefferson, right? Moving on to Jefferson, and remember this guy. Oftentimes, the historiography of him is he was an enigma. He was a puzzle when he was young, and he wrote the Declaration of Independence when he was young and had common um, written intercourse with a, uh, a a French friend, and in their correspondence. He would write what he thought about everything from farming and the soil and climate uh, to big political issues. And it ended up becoming uh, published, supposedly unbeknownst by him, um, but published and known as uh, Notes on the State of Virginia. And in that, he has some very enlightened liberal views, right? But he becomes president and he's anything but enlightened and liberal. So what happened? Was he a hypocrite? Did he become more conservative in age? Uh, did power change him? And of course, according to the textbook, right, it was, quote, and you find that in the last number, forces larger than himself made him feel compelled to give in, right, and become pragmatic instead of idealistic. Instead of idealistically trying to change the world for the better, like you find in the notes on the state of Virginia, he became simply practical and said, I'm going to do what brings about the best practical immediate results uh, as far as my daily decisions instead of what I wanted to do when I was younger and changing and improving this country and the world. All right. So, uh, but Hofstadter, his thesis is tied to his mom and dad. Remember, that's the thesis is that he felt wealth guilt, right? He felt well, he felt wealth guilt and felt like he never received the affirmation he needed from his father. And his father was a, quote, commoner, Peter Jefferson. His mom was aristocracy, Jane Randolph. And that his dad oftentimes identified him with his mother uh, as a, a well-to-do Randolph son. And he uh, had issues with that, uh, according to Hofstadter, and was trying to convince himself long through his middle age uh, that he was not a, an aristocratic Scottish snob, but that he was a man of the people. So is there a sense of kind of compensation and psychological displacement that's going on with Jefferson trying to contend that he's a common man and leader of the common American uh, when he took office in 1800? All right. So let's see here. Number 28, according to the textbook, President Jefferson was surprisingly bipartisan in his appointments? No. He contended that on principle. He talked about the free intercourse of ideas, right? The free exchange of ideas. That you ought to surround yourself with people from different worldviews, different political platforms. Let them hammer out their ideas and let truth, right, um, find its way to the surface. Uh, through that dialogue, through that discourse, through that debate. But he couldn't handle that type of debate. And he kind of surrounded himself arguably with yes men instead when he became president. One of many contradictions about this guy, right? Uh, so let's see here. Uh, remember also with the Northwest or, or with the um, uh, Louisiana Purchase, nothing in the constitution stated that he could buy that land. He did it anyway. He put 21 men in charge of the North, 21 handpicked men in charge of the South, and not, did not allow democratic government in those areas. He said they weren't ready for it uh, because of uh, 
an episode in which um, uh, a, a guy named uh, Wilkinson and Aaron Burr were arguably trying to uh, wrest that territory away from the country. And because there were Cajuns and Creoles, Native Americans and other demographics that he didn't trust with the vote yet. Um, he didn't allow that to happen. Uh, let's see here. 29, uh, President Thomas Jefferson ironically initiated military confrontation with the Basha of Tripoli, yes. And even declared in a, in, in a quasi war, uh, not officially declared Tripolitan war, yes, he did. Uh, did he express belief in essentialist racist stereotypes of African Americans, the Sambo image? Yes, he sadly did and had a love affair with his slave, Sally Hemings, and had four children grow up from that. All right. So number 31, I've already gone over. Number 32, like I said, 32 through 35, I'm gonna give you guys. So that's one, two, three, four. So I'm gonna add four to your test scores. But just to note, the War of 1812 was officially declared against Great Britain, not the French, and Native American tribes allied to Great Britain over violations of Americans' international rights on the high seas and the British allegedly fomenting Native American rebellion here in the Ohio Valley and down in Mississippi and Alabama and Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, uh, 33, during the War of 1812, Canadian civilians and forces enthusiastically embraced an American liberation en masse? No, they did not. Uh, we had three invasions of Canada and they failed miserably. If you happen to jump on that assignment and to have, have watched that video. 34, according to the War of 1812 video, many Ohio Valley uh, Native Americans chose to join the Red Sticks with their red ochre painted tomahawks against the US on account of white settlers intrusions and illegitimate American treaties? Yes, that is true. 35, according to the War of 1812 video documentary, the fight against Native Americans in the South was less intense on account of the deal the US government made um, with the Creek tribe, that is false. So at any rate, I'm gonna give you those anyway. So you get those right, that's even just four more that you could add to your score, okay? So I, I hope that I'm illustrating that for whatever um, areas that I'm, I'm failing in, I want you to do well in my class, all right? Uh, so remember, you have two submissions for this. So make a good go of it, okay? And remember, you have until the 14th instead of tonight, uh, but, but next, um, next assignment, I want you to, uh, to have done on the, four, the night of the 14th as well. So utilize your time well, okay? Mike McGrath, I don't think I had you. So I'm glad you showed yourself on there. Not sure when you came in, but I'll give you credit for today. Let me make sure. All right. Rob, all right. So thank you, Robert, for the uh, for the, the thumbs up. You guys feel better about this test. Yeah. Rose? Good. Good. Thank you, Xander. Good, good, good. Let me go back to the participants because I don't think I have a Shalise, thank you, Robert, thank you. My um, Zoom is under Nye Walker, but my official name is Naila Walker. You got it, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. And I did have a quick question about the War of 1820 um, video assignment. So Please. you're not requiring us to do that or because I read an email or something from you. I wasn't sure if I read it correctly. Exactly. Yeah. If if you've already done it, okay, yeah. you can do it in, in place of the early republic because that's what I switched it with, was with the early republic assignment. I think uh, I did both of those. Okay, good. I'll give you I'll give you up to half credit for the second one as extra credit. 
Okay. So for the second one, you could you could earn up to 25 extra points. Okay, cool. And then also because I show like quite a few assignments not graded yet, and I just want to make sure that I'm on track. Um, yes, I apologize. I need to play catch up. I believe I've only done the first three, three maybe four assignments. So right. I'm I'm okay. uh, yeah I'm I'm definitely behind on that. Sorry about that. And no that worries. will be that will be rectified soon. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you for communicating. I had I yeah. had a question about the textbook quizzes. Sure. It says that the textbook quizzes are put under specific chapter names. Does that yeah. mean it's only for that chapter or for all the chapters leading up to that one? That's a good question. Only for that chapter. Yeah. So yeah, whatever the title okay, states, thank you. no problem. Whatever the title states, uh, the questions and answers to those questions are found just in that given chapter that's stated on the, in the title. But no, that was a good question in case that wasn't clear to anyone else. Um, I also have another question. Sure. Uh, where do we get attend, uh, credit for attending these sessions? Okay, I have a stack of, of each of the classes and uh, I'm gonna put it in a se separate category of as extra credit. Um, but to, I'll tell you what, what I can do is I could add it to, um, I'll send you an announcement, okay? And okay. I'll, I'll let the class know which assignment I've added the score to so that you'll have the points on your end and not just me on my end. Because on my Excel sheet, right? That's what I go off of with your final grade. So I assure you I'm doing the extra credit a, in an extra credit column. Uh, but I'll go ahead and additionally uh, add it maybe even to your test two score. Um, and, and then I'll let the class know via an announcement that your extra credit um, sessions have been uh, added. And remember, it's five points each, uh, with exception of maybe once or so. Uh, I went so uh, in such lengthy fashion that I may have promised you 10 points. But most of the time, it's five points for each of the times. OK, I just want to know. Thank you. No problem. Would it be possible to add it to maybe one of the quizzes that we kind of scored, maybe scored late, lo, low on or because I have a couple yeah. that was. I mean, yeah, to, to, to be honest, uh, I mean, uh, you, Miss Walker, um, it, it really, uh, it doesn't matter to me because as long as your points are added, uh, because I just do the, um, on the Excel sheet, right? I do all the columns. And then I'll, I, all I have to do is, is when I get to the total points, say, uh, you know, uh, equals the sum. And I put okay. in each of the columns, right? B2, C2, D2. And so it's going to add them up. And so it really doesn't matter on my end which column I put them in. Okay. And so I, I'm okay with putting them in. If you have a suggestion, if you'd like me to do it on a quiz instead, uh, it, okay. it really doesn't matter in the end, right? It's, it's all points added. Uh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, wh whatever you like. Thank you. No problem. All right, anyone else? All right. So are we good? Are we good? We feel better about the test? Good, Xander, thank you. I hope so, okay. All right, and so thank you, Alyssa. So um, I'll go ahead and bid you adieu, and I'll wait uh, in a rose, goodbye to you as well. Um, I'll go ahead and wait a minute, and uh, if you have any questions or any issues or anything, uh, just stay on. All right, good, Mike, that's good to hear. Uh, you're very welcome. So uh, go ahead, if you have no questions or issues, go ahead and get off and I'll wait and see if anyone hangs on uh, with a question, comment or issue, okay? So you guys have a great, a great day, okay? And I'll see you Wednesday. You're very welcome, thank you. I'm out of question. Sure. Is test three from everything we learned in the semester? 
No, no, it's not. It, it's not a cumulative. Um, I, I, I didn't want to do that to you guys. Uh, you've already gone through the material. So no, test three is no different from test one and two. It just covers the last like three subjects or so. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right. Anybody else? No problem from Energy, no problem at all. So what I'll do is I'll make a note, okay? I'll make a note with your name um, to, uh, to see all your assignments, okay? So I'll go back to the early stuff if I'm missing something from you uh, to, uh, to grade it, all right? So yeah, just, just try your best to catch up. And I've made a note to myself to, uh, to go back and look at all your assignments. All right, anything else? You're very welcome. All right, you have a good day, okay? Thank you. All right, uh, Maria Diaz, can I help you? Anything I could do to help? Sorry, I was just trying to see if you guys were still doing class. I was trying to log in, but I guess you guys already finished. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we just finished. I went through the test. Um, again, it, it, I apologize, it takes a while, uh, but hopefully you notice that you have now until Wednesday night to do it, and you have, you, you have two, uh, two chances, two submissions, and so uh, I'll do my best to get this video up as soon as possible, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Just wanted to check in. No problem. You're okay. welcome. You have a good day. You too, Maria. Bye-bye.